Welcome to Six African Trade Talks, the show that brings you closer to the intra Africa trade business world. I'm your host, Chad Chawanda. In this episode, our guest is Vuyani Tati. Vuyani is the Group Finance Manager at Startup Bootcamp Afitech. Vuyani, welcome to Six African Trade Talks. How are you? Hi, Chad. Thanks for having me. I'm doing very well. Thanks. Great. Before we start our show, we'd like to hear a word from our sponsors. Would you travel to Cape Town for business or leisure? What if you could combine the two? Well, you can. With Optimum African Experience Cape Town Pleasure Experience, with partners such as University of Cape Town, CEDA, Kadena, Luminary and Prime Focus, experience the best of Africa. Vuyani, please tell us more about your journey thus far. Uh, my journey as any other VC investor is not conventional. So depending on where you want to start, I think I'll start from university, studied at UCT, did a bachelor's in accounting with aspirations to become a CA. Fortunately, that didn't go according to plan. That's when I joined Yoko on a part-time basis initially in 2015, and then joined them permanently two years later when they were still early. And then from Yoko, jumped to SPC in 2019, where I find myself now of which the group finance managers, the initial role I came in, but I wear more hats within the organization. Uh, we can get into that if you want to get into it some more. Great. Thank you very much for sharing. What is Startup Bootcamp Afritech and what services do you guys offer? Startup Bootcamp Afritech is part of a global accelerator program, which is the second biggest program outside of the U.S., second only to Y Combinator. So we're a corporate-backed accelerator program that essentially bridges the gap between startups and corporates uh, by virtue of solving corporate-related problems that they might be facing and finding startups that can plug that gap or better service that particular problem. And for the startups, get them a corporate to be ideally their first or big anchor client. So we see ourselves as the bridge and our program is basically a three month accelerator program that takes a year and a half worth of acceleration and compresses it into three months. So we hyper accelerate our startups that gets them in a position where they're ready to work with the corporates and scale throughout the rest of the market. That's what we do in a nutshell. We also have an investment arm where we take 8% equity in the startups that we accelerate for you know, a nominal amount of, of capital plus added services that total close to you know, $500,000 or more. So that's what we do, essentially, in a nutshell. Interesting. Thank you very much for sharing. How do you find this startup? What's your process? So our scouting process is mainly driven by the pain points that the corporate sponsors provide us. So depending on the challenges that our corporate clients want to you know, solve immediately, we take that criteria and go out to, to source. So that's a three month program where, or a process rather, where we go out onto the continent and we have events called fast tracks where we get to meet startups in their geographical locations. So be it West Africa, East Africa, Northern Africa, and Southern Africa. And we get to meet and interact with a lot of the startups, getting them to understand what we're about and what we do, and hopefully get them to apply for the Accelerates program. And on the closing of the uh, applications, we then surf through the applications based on the criteria given to us by the corporate clients. And then we narrow it down to 20 of the top startups that we've identified. We fly them to our campus, which is currently in Dakar for an event called final selection days and that's where they get to interact with our corporate clients as well as ourselves and after the two-day event we then narrow it down to the top 10 who will be accelerated and accepted into our program and yeah that's pretty much how we select it so we're sector agnostic i think the only strict criteria we have is that it has to be a technology enabled startup and you just need to be post revenue there's no strict number of value to how much revenue you need to be making, but you need to demonstrate that there is, you know, a potential market for your product. Simplistically and very high level, that's how we select these startups. 
Amazing. What a way to solve problems for these corporates and what a way to impact through Startup Bootcamp. Yeah. South Africa is Africa's second largest economy and you are involved in a fintech, Yoko. Any lessons from a fintech startup that you could share with our audience? Well, the lessons I've learned from Yoko, uh, which were amazing years spent, are not necessarily specific to fintech, but it's not lessons that are anything revolutionary. But the key takeaway for me was the true meaning of being customer centric, which is one of the principles we teach here at Startup Bootcamp, like really understanding your customer, really understanding their journey and where they are. And how you can best service them is the best you know, lesson I can give any startup, be it fintech or any other early stage startup. Being very cognizant and knowing your data or your, your metrics. So knowing the right kind of data to be tracking and really understanding what drives sales within your business is very important. So getting a clear understanding of what costs or you know, line items in the income statement you can maneuver around and which levers to pull to get the maximum amount of value is very key. So, you know, simplistically put, one, really understand your customer out of the onset and two, really get into the, the data of your business operations and know exactly which levers you need to pull in order to drive a significant value for your organization, but most importantly for your customers because that's what's going to generate success for you leading forward. That helps you tell a better story. It is about storytelling, and it is also about creating revenue as well and making sure that the customer is happy. So thank you for sharing. What are the critical areas startups should focus on from a finance perspective? That depends on the stage of the startup. So I think for me, I can speak more so to the early stage guys, your pre-seed and seed guys. At this stage, it's all about revenues. So making sure that your revenues are growing as much as possible, because that's at the end of the day is what investors are going to be looking at when investing. And that also helps you really solidify whether or not you have product market fit, in my opinion. You know, that's one of the avenues and what you could look at to really determine whether you have product market fit is the growth in your revenues. So revenues, 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 cash is king. That's nothing new. And your matrices tell your story. So you can have a very good story, but if you don't have the numbers to back it up, uh, it's going to be a very hard sell. It could be a beautiful story, but if the numbers don't substantiate it, uh, no investor is going to back it. No customer is really going to want to buy your product. So those are the two key things in a very early stage. The third one, which I think is way more fundamental, be really selective in the investor you bring onto your cap table. Nothing is as more detrimental other than the people you hire or you bring into your organization as having the right investor on your cap table. Try and avoid the trap, no matter how dire the situation of your startup is, to accept capital for the sake of accepting capital rather do your due diligence as much as the investors will be doing a due diligence on you to ensure that you know, the investor is the right fit for your product and for you and your team, right? Because if there's misalignment between you know, the founders and the investors, that's a recipe for disaster. So be very, very careful in the investors you bring on board. Interesting. Not many people really look at it that way. So thank you very much for sharing because as a startup or as an entrepreneur, the idea is to always say, I need capital, you know, I need to solve this. So whilst, you know, you might bring on someone on board, even employ someone that will make your startup not fundable. So thank you very much for sharing. Very powerful. Before we continue, we'd like to hear a word from our sponsors. Would you travel to Cape Town for business or leisure? What if you could combine the two? Well, you can. With Optimum African Experience Cape Town Pleasure Experience. With partners such as University of Cape Town, CEDA, Kadena, Luminary and Prime Focus. Experience the best of Africa. So Vianney, take us through the concept of impact investing and any examples of global impact driven companies. So from my perspective, what impact investing means is the real impact that you can have on the ground for people on the ground, right? So by that, I mean, how does your product 
affect change for the everyday citizen or person on the ground. And that's what I look for when it comes to impact. And a clear example of a, a business that's in our portfolio that does that quite effectively, there's a couple, but two that come to mind. The first one is Yubante Express out of Senegal, who are a logistics company. So they've taken a concept that's existed on the continent for many years and just modernized it, which is basically moving goods from one city to another, which are generally remote regions in a very simplified and elegant way, in our opinion. So back in the day, what people, well, people still do it, is when they needed to send a package back home, let's say they're living in an urban environment and needed to send parcels back home, they generally would go to, you know, your bus stations or your train stations and look for buses that are going back home. And they would give their parcel with a bit of a fee to someone who's going there with a number for them to call on their arrival to give the package to them. So Yobante has used that similar kind of concept and created relay points along which these packages can go. So anyone who's looking to make extra income can go to a Yobante relay point, pick up a package, and only be going in the general direction in which the package needs to go. So you don't need to be going to the exact city where the package is going. You just need to be going in that roundabout direction. So you pick it up at the initial relay point and then drop it at the relay point in which you know you and the package pathways. And then someone else is going in that particular direction will then pick it up from that relay point and go to the next one and so on and so forth. So on that front, it just makes sending goods far quicker and more efficient. And two, it's kind of created uh, secondary income for anyone really to literally become a courier and make additional income on their journeys. So that's very real impact that we have on the ground. And two is another company called uh, Grow City out of Nigeria that has basically created a subscription service for groceries that allows you know, low income households to not run out of staples. And they get those packages delivered to them monthly via subscription service. And they can pay for it directly or they can get a family member that's out in the diaspora to actually pay for the groceries back home. So that, again, is a very real high touch, high impact uh, startup that we're invested in that, that we've accelerated. So the concept of impact investing in my mind is that it's what is the very real impact that you can have on the ground rather than it being a PR standard or, you know, your traditional DFIs that give people grants but can't really measure what that impact is. Quite interesting models that you have just shared there and how impactful they are. What lessons can you share with an international investor looking to get involved in impact investing across the continent? By definition, I would say, based on my previous answer, that investing in the right startups whose business model touches people is true impact investing. Because the ecosystem is still very new and the beauty of the content is that the business models and the products that are being developed are quite unique. Just investing in the right kind of startup, we can assist you to, to find that, can actually help you have the impacts that, that one desires. That for me is the best mechanism to really get people on the ground. It, it just incentivizes a lot of party to align around a common goal, which is really having the right impact on the ground. So for international investors looking to invest, one, I would really recommend finding the right partner to help you really understand the lay of the land and really understand what it takes to invest on the continent because it's not vanilla, it's not straightforward. And two, if you can find time and means to actually get on the ground and see the work that's being done in the ecosystem, that will really get you to appreciate one, where the ecosystem is and two, just the vast amount of opportunities investors have on the continent, not only to have the right kind of impact, but to make sizable returns because the entry points to investing actually are far lower. Thank you. How can we leverage the AFCFTA, Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, as an investment incentive for Africa? I think for me, the biggest pain point around working on the continent is just the sheer difficulty it is for Africans themselves to travel on the continent. So, you know, the free movement of African citizens on the continent will make such a massive difference, apart from the free 
movement of financial capital across the continent uh, will also have a massive impact in really enticing investors to invest in the continent. But more so, in my opinion, I think it will just also help Africans themselves to really invest in ourselves as a continent, which you know saddens me every time I look at it, at just how difficult it is for an African just to do business in Africa where the mindset sadly is that international investors from the western part of the world parts of the world or you know eastern parts of the world get more favor and carry more favor than africans themselves where it's easy for an american to travel on the continent than it is for me as a south african to travel on the continent where as a south african i still need to apply for a visa to get into an african country or as yourself you know in rwanda having to come to South Africa, also requiring a visa. You know, it goes both ways where it just doesn't make sense in my opinion, let alone flights and travel routes on the continent is just a pain point. For example, traveling from South Africa to Senegal takes us 24 hours because we have to go via Dubai, for example, or Addis Ababa in Ethiopia or Nairobi in Kenya, when a six hour, eight hour direct flight is possible. Just movement of people and capital is how we could generally leverage and create that incentive for investors. You know, it's quite interesting for sure. And it also saddens me to see that Africans don't get an opportunity to grow the continent. And let's hope the tenure of Wam Kelemene, who's also a South African at the AFCFTA Secretariat, will also be able to impact on that issue of travel because that's where it really starts and you just hit it there. So, yeah, thank you for sharing. Any book or podcast recommendation for our listeners? Depends on, on what you're trying to achieve. I can give you about three podcasts that I listen to every week, which kind of opens up my mind, I'll try to be as broad as I possibly can. The first one is called The All In Podcast with Chamath Paliapatia, Jason Kalanasis, David Sachs, and David Friedman. So they have interesting views. The beauty of that podcast is that I don't necessarily agree with everything that they say, but they do raise interesting points. So it's a good podcast to listen to in order to broaden your thinking around certain topics and to get opposing views that could potentially open your mind and ways of thinking. The second one is Free Economics, the famous one with Stephen Dubner. And the last one, I guess, is the Pivot Podcast on the Vox Network with Scott Galloway and uh, Kara Sushay. I'm an avid podcast listener, so there's a lot of podcasts that I listen to, but I think those three cover quite a wide range, I think, of journeys. To sneak in an African one in there that I listen to is the MASH Startup Podcast, which is what the podcast are based out of here, uh, out of South Africa called Mashu. So yeah, those are the top four that I would recommend people listen to, especially the podcast one from a startup founder perspective. Would you travel to Cape Town for business or nation? What if you could combine the two? Well, you can. Optimum African Experience Cape Town Africa is a continent full of potential, but potential means nothing if we don't take action to create value. Let us take action. Thank you for listening to this episode. Don't forget to post and share this episode on your social media platforms. It will help us reach our mission of sharing knowledge about intra-Africa trade and making it available to as many people as possible. Let us grow our continent. We can go far, fast, together. If you can please leave a review on our podcast page or on Apple.